One of the biggest misconceptions advertisers have is, is what you just said, and that is, should I be in social media? Should I be in video? Should I be in connected TV? Should I be? Marketing has changed over the years. What has changed is the way we get the message out. Okay, all of the social media options, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, on and on and on, all of the, the, the digital advertising types of tools, connected TV, et cetera, those types of things, those change and they allow us right, to get the message out to people quickly, efficiently, and more importantly, allow us, people like us, like me, to track and see the efficiency of every dollar we're spent is being spent so we can we can adjust and 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 get better and better but the thing that has not changed and the one mistake that we see on a regular basis is is companies don't spend the time to really create their messaging this is the play your position podcast where we huddle up call the plays and inspire you to run your ball into the end zone are you ready to score more game-winning touchdowns in your life business and career then listen up because it's game time baby now here's your host mary lou kazer hello hello team pyp mary lou kazer here welcome to today's episode of the play your position podcast Today is game day here. Thank you for joining me and my amazing guest because we are going to have a terrific conversation talking about his leadership journey, marketing, what we can do to make ourselves known in a very noisy world and a whole lot of other good stuff. My guest name today is John Gumas and he's coming to us from the beautiful city of San Francisco. John, are you ready for kickoff? Hi, Mary Lou. Absolutely. Let's rock and roll. Let's rock and roll indeed. So John Gumas is the CEO of Gumas, an award-winning full-service San Francisco advertising agency and the country's foremost authority on challenger brand marketing. John is also the author of two books, Marketing Smart and Challenger Brand Marketing, which describe how challenger brands can effectively develop marketing strategies to take on their larger competitors. John currently sits on many boards, including the San Francisco Giants, the San Francisco Chamber of Commerce, the San Francisco State University Foundation, among many others. He was recently inducted into the San Francisco State University Hall of Fame and was alumnus of the year. I love that you are involved, John, with things outside of just your business. And I'm sure we're going to have a chance to talk about some of the work you've done for the community. But first, let's set the stage and have you share with us your story about when you got the call to leadership. How old were you? What was going on in your life? Take us into that part of your journey and we'll go from there. Wow, that's such a great question. And um, yeah, it, you know, I've had I've had my company for well over thirty five years now. Uh, we started in, in the, uh, the mid eighties, and uh, my, my journey started really. You know, I'll go back to college where this is my my major. And I had a I had an advertising marketing degree. That was my major, so it was always a passion. I loved it. I loved everything about marketing. I loved everything about. Uh, 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 marketing and how that translates into everything else, into leadership, into um, into how how to build a business. It was it just I, I couldn't read enough. I was just fascinated. So during college and shortly thereafter college, I you know I was working for a few of the big advertising agencies, and that was a really interesting experience from a lot of perspectives. Uh, first, from a leadership perspective. I was really watching the leaders around me and I was watching how they treated people and I was watching how how people responded to them, how they respected them or did not respect them, what they were saying behind their backs. And I really was taking notice on how that affected the culture of an organization. Mm -hmm. So that was really, uh, um, uh, because I had some good managers, leaders, and some 
that weren't very good. And it was interesting because I, in hindsight, I think I learned more from the ones that were not very good because, yeah, right, you know, the negative example. Yeah, because I, I learned that you know I'm, I don't want to treat people like that. I don't want to be that person. I don't, you know, I don't ever want to do what this person is doing. And um, it was funny that always resonated with me. And um, so, and, and obviously, you know, you learn a lot from the ones you like, the just the way they make you feel and how they motivate you and how you want to do things for them. And um, so I was, I, I, I guess I was, uh, you know, uh, always born to be an entrepreneur. So that way I just gravitated to, to those, to watching their styles and, and taking that into account. But uh, um, my, my journey started uh, probably a couple, three years after, you know, being with these big agencies. And I remember we would sit in these, these me- meetings and prospective new clients would, would come to the agency and sit down in the conference room and really explain what their companies were, what their visions were. And they had some phenomenal ideas. I remember sitting there going, wow, what a great idea for a company. And then at the end of the presentation, the, the, the big wigs uh, that were in the meeting would, would ask them, well, how much money do you have to spend? And they'd throw out a number. And almost all the time, it wasn't enough. And they would say, well, thanks, but uh, we can't work with you. Hmm. So that happened. You know, that started to happen on a regular basis. And so... I started wondering myself, where are these people going? Right? They have great ideas and their, their, their leadership is sound, but they just don't have you know, the, the money to spend that, that these big agencies felt was viable for them. So one, one day, I, 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 there was one client in particular that I just fascinated with. So they, they, <laughs> they told them, well, sorry, we can't help you. So the gentleman is walking out and I walked out with them and... Uh, um, rode down the elevator with him to the bottom. And when you get to the bottom, he says, uh, and, and I asked him, I go, what are you going to do? And he says, I don't know. He says, why don't you help me? Hmm. And, and those were the magic words. And that's where, uh, um, you know, my, my journey started. And that's when I started my company with, with those words. And I, I wow. left the big agency and started this, this, my agency. And it all started around this, this, concept, this methodology that, that uh, started way back then, it's now uh, trademarked as challenger brand marketing. Mm-hmm. So it's a concept of marketing that's designed for not the big gorilla, but those companies that are competing with the big gorillas. Because in the world of marketing, as, as you probably know, if you don't have the most money to spend or, you know, the greatest resources and, and resources can be seen in a, in a multitude of, of, of arenas. And that, that could be a, you know, you don't have the biggest sales force. You don't have the most retail locations. You don't have the most brand recognition. It, not having enough money is always one of them. <laughs> it's funny how that yes, works. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. <laughs> so, you know, we started this, this methodology and since over the last 35 years have been perfecting it. And, uh, um, now it's, it's, uh, uh yeah, all of our clients are, are are using it and it just works great because it's such a systematic approach to building a business. And that's that's the key uh, that I really want to emphasize is marketing is not about marketing. Marketing is about building a business. And mm. you, you we use the tools of marketing, specifically challenger brand marketing, to help our clients build a business. Because everyone has different objectives in terms of where they want their companies to go, um, where they want it to be positioned, where they want it to to be a year from now, three years from now, five years from now. And, you know, marketing needs to be the tools that help them get there. Yes. So I want to pause for a minute because you've said a couple of really key things. The first one that I... I picked up, well, there's three that I wanted to emphasize. The first one was you you cut your teeth in a in a big arena. You worked for larger agencies and were able to witness the the goods and the bads of what goes on inside there from a leadership position. And I think that's valuable. Uh, obviously, you were a young man, but I think that that can serve us at any point in time is sometimes just getting into uh, the scene. Right. And then the second piece that you brought up that I think is so instrumental to anybody who is actively building their leadership practice is being aware enough so that when someone asks a question like, can you help me? 
you don't hesitate to answer either yes or no. You said yes. Now, you could have said no because perhaps your path was leading you somewhere else. But the fact that that you recognized on a perhaps an intuitive level that this was this was where you were going to go, that then set in motion everything since, right? So I think that that in a way you were preparing yourself for that moment without maybe knowing that's what you were doing. And I've I've been asking this question now for so long. I, I find it so fascinating how so often, unless a person started their leadership journey as a child because of fami- their family circumstances, it's often in a moment like that, like like you had. And then th- the third piece is this whole business of we think about resources and the large brands that everybody's familiar with, you know, you and I could list some of the the biggies that um, as a baseball fan, you know, they advertise during the games, right? So we, we see these big brands all the time if you watch live television. And if you're a small or medium-sized brand or trying to get your yourself noticed, first of all, it's encouraging to hear that there are options. And so let's talk about this concept of challenger brand marketing because most businesses are small and don't have unlimited you know uh cash piles that they can just go grab to make the coolest newest campaign so what's a what's a small brand to do john help us out yeah, here yeah yeah <laughs> sure you know and and challenger brands come in all shapes and sizes and industries and you know, they're, they're for profits, they're nonprofits, they're, you know, they, they're, they're, it's, it's a methodology that, that applies to so many, you know, uh, companies. You know, you, you talk about, you know, the, the, the sports sponsors, you know, like Pepsi is a challenger brand to Coke, Avis is oh. a you know, challenger brand to Hertz. And, and the list goes on and on and on. So, um, you know, it, it's, it, challenger brands have to realize, right? They're a challenger brand. Mm-hmm. Define define that term for us. I, I think people can figure out just from the word, but I'd love for you to to uh, because it's your concept. What what exactly is that? Yeah, it's any company, any organization, no matter of size or industry, that is competing in a marketplace against organizations that have greater resources than they. And Got resources it. can be defined in in terms of marketing dollars. Marketing, you know, marketing, advertising budgets. They it can be defined as a sales force. You know, the competitor has a hundred salespeople, and we have two. It could be retail locations. It can be all the way down as simple as brand awareness. Uh, so it's it's you're 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 competing. You're an underdog, right? You're an underdog to to whoever you're up against. <clears throat> so it's a process of how do you take the the resources you have the mar- usually the marketing resources you have and apply them to generate the greatest possible return the greatest possible ROI and that is really different Mary Lou than creating the perfect marketing program or the perfect marketing plan very different because i've been doing this a long long time i've never met the clients and we've worked with some big ones who have enough money to create the perfect marketing plan you know, as, as compared to their, 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 their guerrilla competitors. So the process becomes, how do you create the ideal marketing plan within the resources you have that allows you to systematically grow a company? And what I mean by that is, <laughs> you know, yes, real quickly, what I mean by that is, is you want to go, think of, a, think of a, a staircase. Your goal is to get from the ground floor to stair one then to stair two, stair three, stair four, and, and, and that's your growth versus, you know, trying to get to the top of the staircase, which, which you know, a, a lot of marketing programs we try to do, but, but we believe it should be a very systematic, very controlled, uh, very organized um, uh, process that, that eliminates all risk. So you know that you're going to be growing and you know that every day, every week, every month, you're going to take a step forward. Mm-hmm. Okay, so let's have a for example. What are in in this social media driven, internet driven? Is it video? Is it? And I, I, it's almost rhetorical because it really depends, right? On 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 what your goals are, what 
what your who your audience is, you know, demographics and all that kind of thing. But just I guess um, for people listening who may be beating their head against the marketing wall, take us inside using the challenger brand methodology, something that maybe someone listening could implement tonight or tomorrow and, just to get started. Yeah. And, and what you just outlined is one of the biggest issues. I don't want to use the word mistake because that's negative. I'm not going to use that word. But I think one of the biggest misconceptions advertisers have is is what you just said. And that is, should I be in social media? Should I be in video? Should I be in connected TV? Should I be... Well, here's... Marketing has changed over the years. What has changed is the way we get the message out. Okay, all of the social media options, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, on, on, and on. All of the, the, the digital advertising types of tools, connected TV, et cetera, those types of things, those change. And they allow us right to get the message out to people quickly, efficiently, and more importantly, allow us, people like us, like me, to track and see the efficiency of every dollar we're spent is being spent so we can we can adjust and 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 get better and better but but and this is a capital I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm doing the air thing here <laughs> capital b u capital b u t but the thing that has not changed and the one mistake that we see on a regular basis is is companies don't spend the time to really create their messaging because really I don't, yeah, I don't care how much money you spend in social media, connected TV, television, radio, whatever you spend. If I don't care how much money you spend, if you don't go through a process to figure out your messaging properly, and what I mean by messaging is what do you need to say in a way that is unique to you, that is going to resonate with the people you want to reach and is going to get them to take some sort of action. If you Mm. don't, if you don't take the time to really develop that, then I don't care how much money you spend. It's never going to achieve the full potential of what you're spending. So, you know, in, in philosophically, right, what, ha- what has changed are all these wonderful bells and whistles tools that allow us to get the message out. What hasn't changed, and in my opinion will never change, is this process of one human being speaking to another human being. Because, you know, we've all heard of B2B marketing and um, and I'm not a fan of B2B marketing. I, I'm not a fan of the name B2B marketing. Yeah, I'm not either. Yeah, because never in my, in, in, you know, my lifetime, if I've ever seen a business buy from another business, I've seen a human at a yes. business <laughs> buy from another human at a business. So what that means is, you know, messaging needs to evoke emotion, right? Messaging needs to get the person you're speaking to to say, ah, wow, I really need that. Or wow, how did you know that's what I'm looking for? Wow, well, that's, 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 I got to get that. So that process of creating that message doesn't happen by accident. And what tends to happen, and um, this is, it, it just, I, I'm sure this is some sort of psychological study that that is way beyond my pay grade, but all of us, what we see, right? All of us as as humans, right? When when uh, um, when we're speaking to to new clients, they will say things like, "I know exactly what my customer needs to hear. I know my customer really well. I know my customer needs to be told this." And what what happens is they know their company so well. They live it every single day. It's truly and maybe literally impossible for them to step outside of their company and look at their company from the outside like someone would who'd never heard of your company before. Mm -hmm. Um, And because in our philosophy, it's all your marketing must be targeted to somebody who's never heard of you before, right? People Mm -hmm. who know of you, people who know, and and that's, that's a big, that's a very common mistake is you're, you're marketing to people who know you. And there's a time and place for that. You know, there's really three targets that we look at. You have your acquisition, which is, you know, marketing, which is new clients. You have retention, which are existing clients. And what we have internal, which is, and we can talk about that later, internal would be the folks in your company that need to know uh, um, what this company stands for. So 
when you look at that concept of people, you know, thinking they really know what their, what their customers say is a very dangerous proposition because it's literally 100% of the time when we go through a, a messaging discovery process, we, we prove our clients wrong. What they think their clients need to hear is actually not what your client wants to hear. And once you learn what your client wants to hear, now all of a sudden, all of the things we, we spoke about a minute ago, you know, social media, Facebook, uh, uh, LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, starts to work even better. All of a sudden, your salespeople all of a sudden are closing more business because they're, they're, they're saying the right thing. All of a sudden, your websites are generating more leads because people going there are, 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 you know, are hearing what they need to hear. So it, it just works dramatically better. But most companies, it's, it's amazing that just they don't go through that process because it's just this kind of natural thing that happens is you truly, truly believe, you know. And that's yeah. not a knock on companies at all, but you truly, truly believe. But, you know, well, what we have to remember is let's just take an, a website for an example, because that's easy for me to describe. Uh, we, we work on, on a philosophy, we've, philosophy that we've developed, and it's called the seven second rule. So when someone comes to your website, you have seven seconds to tell them who you are, what you do, and what's in it for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And if and if you, you know, if you can't get that across in seven seconds, they're gone. They're gone typically. And and uh, um, so how do you do that? How do you say that? And you know, there, there's my favorite quote in the whole world, and it was by Mark Twain. And Mark Twain once said, "said I would have written you a shorter note, but I did not have the time." Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> so it, it, it really just perfectly explains what we as marketers have to do. And that is, you know, you have to take this, this, you know, describe a company in a very, very short, concise way. That's how you start a conversation. You know, there's a time and a place to tell people everything you do. There's a time and a place, but it's not during that first initial introduction. The purpose of the first initial contact is to get them to want more, get them to ask for more. And that's mm-hmm. when you can begin the selling, the real selling part. And you've got to be able to trigger that pain point instantly because that's why people are looking for solutions. We usually aren't looking for a solution when life is great. It's you know, when we have an issue, when we have a problem that we need right. help solving, right? And Again, really jam-packed info uh, and insight you just shared with us, particularly about the messaging, how you in 35 years, and you think about going back, you know, I lived through the 80s. So I, we remember a time, John, you and I and our peers before the internet, when advertising was looked different than it does today. Now, conceptually, I think, you know, some things are universal, right? That have carried over from decade to decade, but the delivery method has definitely changed and attention spans are different. We've been, we've been over, Mar- I mean, all of us have been exposed to how there's stats on this about how many gazillion marketing messages we're bombarded with in a lifetime now. So coming back to what you do with, with the work with Challenger Brand, Marketing is is cut, helping companies cut through the noise and differentiate. If you don't have the dollars, let's say you you've got a strong message, but you don't have the dollars. So what what are some ways people can differentiate? Yeah, absolutely. And you know, and if you if you can't outspend, you have to outsmart. Yeah, and, oh, I like and, that. You know, and that's that's really the whole concept behind challenger brand marketing is is outsmarting. And the, and the way you, you outsmart is by doing your research to really understand who you are and, and what you need to say. So the, the methodology we use, we, we go, we use a five step process. Uh, so, so the first, the first part, and I'll go, I'll go into detail of each of these, if you like. Um, the, you know, the first part is what we call discovery. That's asking the right people, the right questions to get the answers you really need to know to be successful. And from that information comes the strategy and the messaging. So it, how am I going to do it? What am I going to say? That, that comes from that data. So you're not guessing. 
Then from there, once you have the words in place, then the what we refer to as the creative. That's when you start to design. You design the websites, you design the ads, you design the social media, you design the look and feel um, that 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 applies to that positioning, to that messaging. And then the fourth step is what we refer to we refer to as the go-to market plan. And we'd like to surround the audience that we're looking at. So if our, if our budget allows for us to reach the United States, we reach the United States. If our budget allows us to reach the San Francisco Bay Area, well, that's what we do because we can concentrate our message and it will be impactful. Uh, so so we, we look at that, you know, how do we create that go-to market plan? And the fifth step is really an ongoing step. It's an ongoing process of constantly evaluating daily, weekly, uh, um, the, the programs that are out there to maximize them, to optimize them. So they generate greater, greater, greater results as we, as we move. So, okay. you know, I can, you know, the, the discovery part, which is the most important part of this whole process, because if that's off, everything's off. And discovery is really kind of a fancy word uh, um, for, for research. But research is the thing that you have to be really careful about because you can easily get the wrong information <laughs> that, you know, that takes you down the right path. And, you know, it, it, we're, over the years, right, we've learned not to be fans of things like focus groups, not be fans of, of like an uh, 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 online uh, questionnaire because it's too easy to tell you what you want to hear. It's too oh. easy to check a box. It's just too easy. And as a result, you don't get the right information. You know, it's like me asking you, so Mary Lou, what do you think of me? I say, oh, well, you seem like a nice guy. I just met you. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's not the information I need, right? I need no, the real. No, that's very, yeah. So we go through a very uh, um, uh, uh, detailed process of asking the right people, the right questions in the right order. But the questions are very, you know, they're, they're non-conventional. And they're non-conventional for a reason because we want your emotional response. Because we mm -hmm. believe the emotion is where the truth lies. Yes. And, you know, and there's yeah. no yes, there's no yes or no answers. You know, if, uh, um, you know, you're, let's say you're doing business with a company, we'll ask you if there's one thing you can change about that company, what would it be? You know, what, you know, and, and not, do you like this? Do you like that? And there's a whole series of questions that just, just stack on top of each other. So what we do, we, 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 create these, you know, these fun questions, these emotionally charged, uh, unconventional questions, which all have kind of a scientific base to them. But there's, there's three parts of, of, the, of the discovery we, we want to connect with. The first is customers. We want to speak to our customers' customers. So we want to speak to good customers. We want to speak to okay customers. We want to speak to maybe not okay customers. And if we can, <laughs> maybe some old past customers. So we want to get a 360 degree uh, understanding of, of customers and, and, and what they truly are looking for. And ultimately, what we're trying to find out is what are the words we have to say to you to get you to go, ah, that's it. That's exactly what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. So we do that with our customers. Then we do with something very similar, same, you know, similar questioning to what we call internal stakeholders, our clients, right? So the C-suite individuals, the marketing people, the customer facing people. And we ask them similar questions that we ask our, our, uh, their customers. And Mary Lou, I've been doing this over 35 years. Not one time, not one time has what our customers think. <laughs> they need to say to their customers, align with what their customers need to hear. Not once. Really? And not once. And it, it's... It so everybody's getting it wrong. Well, you know what? That That's harsh. <laughs> well, <laughs> I okay. I yeah, take it back. <laughs> <laughs> it's halftime here at the Play Your Position podcast. And we've got ourselves a great game. While you're up grabbing another snack and topping off your favorite beverage, make sure to subscribe to the show so you never miss another play. PYP is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever great podcasts can be found. 
Now, let's get back to the game. So uh, I never want to say that to anybody, although you're right. It, 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 it just has to misalign a little bit to not be fully connected. And the other part of this internal, right, and our customers internal, is we, we put them through what we call a symposium, where we'll put the key folks in a room and lock for maybe a half a day, lock the door from the outside and take them through similar types of exercises designed to get them, all of them on the same page. Because again, they're, most of the time, they're not connected on the same page. So by the time we leave, everyone is, is in alignment. Wow. So those are, those are the two of the, you know, of, of, in the discovery, two of the three parts. The third part, which is really important as well, is we do a really deep dive on our main competitors. Because we need to know what our competitors are saying. Because they're speaking to the same prospects we want to talk to. Right. So what, what are they saying? How are they saying it? Um, how are they differentiating, differentiating themselves? How are they positioning themselves? That is incredible and valuable knowledge that we need to have. So from those three pieces, the, 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 the interviews, and by the way, these are one-on-one telephone interviews with individuals. We interview these folks one-on-one on the telephone. And they're done on the telephone because it's, it's less intimidating. No one's sure. looking you in the eye. No one's. So that's why we do it on, on the telephone. So after we've done the uh, um, interviews with the, the uh, um, external customers, the internal the stakeholders, and then the competitive analysis from that, from that data, the strategy is developed. What is going to be our overall strategy and what is going to be our overall messaging? What are the actual words that we're going to be using? So. If you do the discovery right, strategy and the messaging kind of create themselves because it's all based on data. It's, it's, there's no guessing. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a key thing to emphasize here. You never, ever want to say, I think this is what we should, you know, our message should be. I think huh. this is what our plan should be. <laughs> that, the I think part, I think are probably two of the most expensive words in, oh, in marketing. That's powerful. So. Now you've got, you've got the, the, the strategy and the messaging and, and the messaging, right? What we, what we create, what we believe kind of the core messaging should be the, the, you know, the longest form of a message should be, you know, something like, like an elevator pitch. Um, we all know what an elevator pitch is, right? You get an elevator at the top of, I'm in San Francisco. I'll, I'll use the Salesforce tower. Uh, you and I meet, uh, at the top of, of, of Salesforce tower and you ask me and I have a, have a logo shirt that says Gumas and you say, Gumas, what does that mean? I have from the time we get to the bottom floor and that door opens uh, to not only tell you what I do, but I have to convince you to want to continue the conversation. Mm-hmm. So the elevator pitch as we created is, is really answering four questions. Like the first one is, who are you? Is, is, uh, who are you, right? That, that's yeah. really important. <laughs> what do you do? Mm-hmm. What, what makes you special? What makes you different? from all the other competitors that I will be looking at. And finally, the most important one, and ironically, it's it, many times, this isn't even included in many elevator pitches that we see, is what's in it for you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which is the most important uh, 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 question asked. So it's those four questions that kind of make up that, 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 that largest form of, of messaging, the, the elevator pitch. And from there, you know, we, 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 uh, um, we carve it out to different things from vision statements, positioning statements, all the way down to the smallest form of messaging, and that's a tagline. So that's really the core messaging that all companies should have. And when it comes to selling a prospect or engaging a prospect or starting a conversation with a prospect, you should not have any more than that because you know it, it, it's, it's the concept of you say too much, you don't, you don't say anything. Right, it becomes overwhelming, and and I I know having experienced it, being on the receiving end of asking a question like, "Oh, what is that?" and then someone verbally vomits all over me, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> "I don't even know where to focus. I don't even, you know, no, no." I, I'm immediately put up a wall, and I admire the enthusiasm, <laughs> the excitement that people might have. But it is raining it in, and it sounds like that process you just described is really can be very helpful to get it, things ex- very succinct, 
and impact driven. Yeah. And, and plus, you know, you want everyone in the organization from the CEO down to the lowest level line employee to be able to describe, describe the company in the same, in the same way. Yeah. And there's, there's, there's also another uh, phenomenon that we're seeing that's, that's happening right now. And that is, you know, all of us as consumers, you, me, your listeners, all of us, we are really savvy. I mean, we, you know, yes. we can, we can find information where, you know, we're, we're smart about products and services. So as a result, we do not want to be sold to, right? The moment we feel somebody is trying to sell us something is the moment you kind of hesitate, the moment you step back a little bit and maybe their credibility, their, their, your trust factor in them starts to, starts to, you know, go down. So. It, you can't selling is is really uh, um, not a good thing nowadays. So so the question becomes, how do you sell without selling? Yes, and that's that's the new world of of marketing. That is at the heart of challenger brand marketing. Is mm. you you can't you you can't do it because people won't trust you. People won't believe your brand. They won't feel good about doing business with you. So it, 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 there there there's a time and place to sell. But, you know, when you're initially trying to generate or create a, a, a relationship with a prospect, that is not the time. Right. And no, it's not. Having patience is um, in short supply today because technology has created the illusion that we can do things very fast. And humans are still, at the end of the day, in control of the credit card. <laughs> 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 you know? Um and 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 I would absolutely, as a consumer myself, I don't want to be sold to. Nobody does. And yet, as a businesswoman, you know, I have services that I know are valuable, and and so there's a process of uh, building relationship, nurturing the relationship, um, listening to what what are picking up on the pain points. Where are people struggling? What what do people need help with? You know, like that day. <laughs> Way back in the 80s when right there, someone turned to you and said, will you help me? You had no, you didn't have a company, John. You hadn't formed an agency yet. You were just, you, you that was a perfect example of, of proximity and marketing creates a wider proximity than, you know, you, you your little circle now your example earlier of if, hey, if we can just do the San Francisco area, then we just do the San Francisco area. If we can do the whole, whole United States, we can do the whole United States. But I learned a long time ago, proximity is power. And mar yeah. marketing helps develop that in your absence. Would you agree with that? Is that part oh, of marketing's job? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and uh, um, it, it is. And, and you know, it, it's, Back to, you know, the example you just gave about when, when I started, I didn't realize it at the time, you know, because I, I, I hadn't had 35 years of experience under my belt. I didn't experience it at the time. But what I had done is I, with, with this gentleman that was, uh, um, that started the, 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 the company, the first company, I had created a rapport with him. I, he, had, he trusted me. He felt yes. good about me because he felt that I knew the information and he he didn't feel I was selling him anything, so he he believed in me. He trusted me. He that and that's really the point I'm I'm trying to make because you do such a great job of that. Just look at what you're doing. Your your podcast is incredibly successful. The guests you have on are great. I love listening to your podcast because your information. Oh, your thank information, you. Oh, you're welcome. But your information is phenomenal. But what you do is you inform people, you educate people, and ultimately that makes you a thought leader. Because you are, you're a thought leader and people look to you. So that's what companies have to, have to consider themselves as being uh, or thought leaders that help prospects make the right decision. Yeah. And then the marketing is way right kind of where you, you kind of pull that towards, well, we are the right decision, right? Yes. But it's respecting who you're talking to. It's respecting your your customers and your prospects, and and understanding that that they you know they have choices, and you have to convince them in, that you are uh, um, there to help them, not there to sell them something. Right. Um, 
but you know, and ultimately I get it. It's a business. Everyone's a business. And ultimately you have to sell Everybody. something, but <laughs> yeah. it's the process, right? It's the process that you get to, to, to establish credibility, believability, um, and all those other things that you have to have for someone to say, great, uh, I, I want to talk to you about this. Yeah. Boy, respect goes a long way in, in, in an era when there's so many scams because of technology. I was just talking to a friend of mine yesterday about um, a, a, a specific app where you can, uh, it's a reselling app and she's used it in the past to sell, you know, some items. And she said, it's a, she goes, Mary Lou, I just can't get over how many scams come through there. And so with the, that's just one small example of what kinds of decisions people are making every day, all day long. I know that sounds simplistic, but if you say you have a whole garage full of items that, that you know there's market value, well, there are apps that have been, platforms that have been created that you can sell them. I mean, eBay is probably was the first big player kind of set the stage. You want to talk about being a challenger brand, everybody who's gone up against eBay, right? <laughs> but the, the point is, is that any whatever kind of business you're in, you know that your your customer is struggling with something. And I don't know, are there certain businesses that are easier to develop marketing campaigns for because the problem is I'm thinking of I'm thinking of pest control. <laughs> Of all things, because it's <laughs> spring and and creatures are beginning to reemerge from their winter slumber. And so we've got insects and we've got rodents and we've got all these things. Well, that's a perpetual problem um, ver versus, a, versus a, a different kind of service-based business. It might be a little bit more ephemeral. It's harder to, you know, you're not trying to go trap a bunch of bees or, or hornets. You're going to trap metaphorical hornets, which is a little bit more difficult to explain why you would want to buy. You, you see what I'm getting at? So it's like I do, I do. It's pretty yeah. deep. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's, yeah. You, there was a lot of things in there, right? There's there's certainly seasonal things. Uh, all, but it just emphasizes that every company, every organization is unique, and there is not one size fit all. That's why yeah. you need to go through this process of, of really learning why people want to buy from you. I mean, really, really learning the truth, why, and then getting to the point where what are the words you have to say to them that get them to really stop and go, ah, exactly what I'm looking for. Exactly. What, how did you know? And, um, you know, again, that doesn't happen by, by accident. No. And, and it, it works, you know, it works for nonprofits, it works for sports teams, it works for medical companies, it works for everyone. And I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you an example of a, of a company that you'd never think, but they were, is a company that was in the medical arena. And uh, um, this was a product they made and it was purchased by, you know, doctors, therapists and hospitals all over the world. And um, it was of, of, all the products available in their category, they were the most expensive. And they really had a, a high quality product. So they were doing well. Now all of a sudden, a low cost uh, competitor comes in from overseas and cuts the price in half uh, of, the, of the product, cuts the price in half. So now they're, you know, their sales are starting to, 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 to you know, be impacted. Their sales team is coming back saying, you know what? People are buying the other product. The customers I used to sell to are saying, yeah, but John, it's 50%. I can't, I can't let that go. So their market, this is, we hadn't been, we were not working with this company. So at, at that point, they brought us in and said, help us figure out what's going on. And their messaging was created by the engineers in the company that, that really talked to the, the engineering wonder of, of this product. And it was great and, and phenomenal. But their competitor was saying similar things. So fast forward, we take them through this discovery process that I just described in boring detail. So forgive me for that. You know, we took them through that process. And what we learned is the people buying their product, the therapists, the doctors, were not buying it so much because of the technology 
they were buying it because of the impact it made on their patients, on their patients' lives, on, on even on their time, because they would spend half the time when they use this product versus a competitive product. So this is this was a big aha, because they never thought about this. They never thought this purchase was emotional in any way. It was doctors, it was therapists, it was they were just doing what they're doing. They forgot that doctors and therapists are human beings. They're Facing people. other human beings. Exactly, you know, and, and, yeah. and they're no different than us. And so we, we took all this data and repositioned the company and remessaged this company to this concept of, you know, what we do matters. You know, it matters. Therefore, you know, the product you, that you give your patient matters. It's going to matter because it's going to help their life. And it's going to matter because it's going to help you because instead of seeing three patients an hour, you can now see six patients an hour at a higher level of, of, of impact. And, and this concept from, uh, you know, mechanical product to emotional, it matters and why it matters mm-hmm. made all the difference in the world. So I'm, I'm doing the, the, the air thing here with my hand, you know, with the <laughs> sales the going air down. Yeah, <laughs> but the, yeah, sales are going down. So my hand's going down and it's a U at the bottom and it starts to go up again. Oh, and yeah. fast forward to today, they are again, the market leader selling their product at top price and yeah. their customers are happily paying it because we've told them why they need to pay it. Yes, and it's I, not, it's, it's not about the money. It's about the return. It's about the emotion. It's about the importance. It's about the impact on the world, on their patients that this product, uh, uh, uh provides. So yes, that's what every company needs to do. They need to understand what, what their aha is, what, what that difference is. And then they need to articulate it in such a way that nobody else can say it. So they own that niche. They own it because once they own a niche, and they can own it in a way that they can defend it from anyone. I don't care who you are, you're going to be incredibly successful. I love that. That's so inspirational and it gives it gives me hope as a as a very, you know, s- small creative operation and I know I have listeners who are that way and I also know I have people in my audience who work for larger organizations, nonprofits and and also for profits and what you just described is is something that that everybody faces is how do I stand out? And also I like that you emphasize it's not about the money always. Sometimes people think, oh, I have to compete on price. My message has to be about value. And if they, actually, the value is often not monetary. The value is what you just described. That feeling that people get knowing that they're working with a trusted brand and they're willing to pay more People think, oh, the, everybody's going to go with the cheapest option. No, no, they're not. <laughs> time yeah, and time agree, again. I, I could not agree with you more. You know, we, we advise that, that you never want to compete on price because no. that's, a, that's a race to the bottom. It is. Um, you know, it's okay for price to be a, uh, an incredible and wonderful surprise. Like, wow, I was expecting this to cost more. But you do not want to or avoid, if you can, discounting. And if you do discount or you do create a promotion, make it, make it, give it a reason, right? It's our, it's our 10th anniversary. It's, it's, we're celebrating something, you know, right. but, but, but don't do it as a strategy. And, and I get it. If you're, if you're a discount store, well, that's what you are. Right. But that's but, baked into your brand. It, it, exactly. I don't do it to do it. So that that's dangerous for us. Try to build value and surprise mm-hmm. with price. Yes. Oh, I love it. Well, you were talking about differentiation. I'd like you to share a couple of books, John, that have made a difference to you on your leadership journey that you could share with listeners. Well, so I'm I'm, my, I'm not going to mention my two favorite books, Marketing Smart or Challenger Brand Marketing, since I wrote them, and that would be <laughs> that would be self that, that would be self serving. And remember, you don't want to sell, right? So that that's never good. People don't trust you if you sell. So because of that, I won't mention those two books. Okay, we um, won't mention those. <laughs> but uh, um, there was one that I remember reading a long, long time ago that I still have on my shelf. And it was, it was by a guy by the name of Robert Pritikin, who was a very famous uh, uh, local ad guy. And the title was Christ Was an Ad Man. 
Oh, uh-huh, interesting. And just, yeah, and, and this guy was an eccentric, creative, you know, madman type advertising guy. And just really, I, I, I just always enjoyed it. And it's, it's funny and it's eye-opening. And uh, um, the other, it, it's, you may laugh at me, but it's a book called, you know, Who Moved My Cheese? Oh, yes. And it, <laughs> yeah, and it's just, it's just one of those things that just kind of gets you thinking about where you want to go, what you want to do. Uh, yeah, so if there were two I'd throw out there, uh, I'd Good. those would be two to consider. Well, you know, team, that you'll be able to find links to these books along with John's books over at his show notes page at pypodcast.com. And now, John, I'm going to have you tell us where do you hang out online so we can add that link to your show notes page as well. Sure. Well, you know, gumas.com, G-U-M-A-S.com is where you can find. I mean, a lot of, um, you know, a lot of helpful resources. We have... uh, um, a, a lot of, you know, we have great blog. We have uh, um, a lot of great information. If, if your listeners just want, want to educate themselves a little more. And also they can, uh, um, they can go online. They can, they can download our first book for free. Oh, very nice. We, yeah. So they can do that. Um, or, you know, if anyone, I guess, you know, I also, they can subscribe to our uh, um, e-newsletter and all of our social media links are, are uh, um, on the website. But if someone just wants to ask me a question, they can email me. Happy to answer a question. That's just jgumas at gumas.com. The so letter Fabulous. J, Gumas. Yeah. Happy yeah. to answer a question. All they have to do is mention your name and I'll uh, happy to answer the questions. Yeah, you know, if you have a question for John, team, you know, send him with the subject line, heard you on PYP or heard you, you know, talk with Mary Lou or something and that'll trigger for him. And I also am going to highly recommend if you are looking to up your marketing game, get his Challenger brand marketing book. It's, uh, I've, I've, I've gone through it. It is really effectively presented. Lots of, of easy to read bullet points. You can jump around and find what you're looking for. And at the end of the book, he's got the, this cute little Q&A where he took some uh, FAQs, I'm guessing, which I chuckled as I was reading because it's it's um, some common, common questions and then uh, very honest and direct answers that can lead you in the proper direction. And listen, everybody can everybody can benefit from learning more about marketing and particularly to just go back to your main point today that that I'm taking away John which is know what your message is and who you're talking to it's so and so important um and I would like to give you a chance to leave us with some parting words what what would you like to emphasize about succeeding as a business today given everything yeah. that's going on <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't watch the news would be my first thing. Uh, Amen. <laughs> the, uh-huh. so yeah, you know what? I would say don't guess. Really don't guess. As as much as you think you might know the answer, chances are you, you what you think is not what your customers think. And really, really know that. And remember that, you know, the words I think are very dangerous. Hey team, Mary Lou here. Who's number one in football changes from year to year. Fashion trends come and go, same with musical tastes, but leadership skills, they never go out of style. In fact, these days, leadership is an essential survival skill for a world that demands more from us than ever before. To succeed these days, you need to know how to show up for yourself so that you can then do the work you love with people you like the way you want. The Play Your Position Leadership Playbook helps you do this, and it's free. Go to pypodcast.com to download your copy today. If being more successful this year, next year, in the 21st century is on your to-do list, get your copy of the Play Your Position Leadership Playbook now. pypodcast.com. It's at the top of the page. You can't miss it. That's pypodcast.com and start being more of the leader you are meant to be today. This podcast was produced by Daniel Romeros. Show notes for this episode can be found over at pyppodcast.com. I'm Mary Lou Kayser. Thanks for listening. Here at the Play Your Position podcast, we believe that the road to self-mastery and a life well-lived starts with answering the call to leadership. That's when the fun really begins. Send this episode to any friends who might need to hear the inspiration and ideas you heard today. And feel free to rate and review us on your favorite podcast platform.